Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data webinar series with host Adrian Balls. Today, Adrian will discuss transform industries with AI, manufacturing, and retailing. And retail, <laughs> just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton, and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Adrian, everything's looking good. Hello and welcome. <laughs> Hi, what a day. <laughs> well, thank you, Shannon, and thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. All right, let's get going here. So, in about forty-five minutes, I'm going to give you my three steps for transforming your enterprise with artificial intelligence. Any enterprise, any industry can benefit from applying these steps. I would tell you now, but you're not ready. So let's start with some context. We can start by thinking about something that you bought recently, or maybe something that you're planning to buy soon. Uh, it could be as major as an automobile, uh, as minor as toilet paper. Just think of one object, one physical object that you either just bought or you're planning to buy. Now, think back to a time 20 or 30 years ago. If you're uh, young enough that that's a pain, then think about uh, what your parents were doing in those days. Where did you or your parents buy the same item or its equivalent? Basically, uh, same, buy a car 20 years ago or toilet paper or a hair dryer, an appliance, something like that. I want you to think about the difference in experience. Think about what it was like that 20 or 30 years ago. Where was the item that you're thinking about made? How was it made? Is it something that was made by hand, by machine, something that's mined? And how did you know then where it was made or how it was made? How did you decide then versus now on how you are going to acquire it. which product, assuming there are alternatives. You're buying a car, there are a lot of different kinds. How do you make that decision versus how it was made a couple of decades ago? How long did it take you to decide on what you're buying now? How long did it take you or your parents to do it 20 or 30 years ago? Did you comparison shop? Uh, all those things for a minute. How long did it take you to get what you wanted once you knew what you wanted? Today, we're going to look at how some manufacturers are using artificial intelligence to make the right products for retailers and how retailers are using AI to bring them to you and to your families or to your business. To get started, I want to um, provide some additional context, if you will, and use a framework that I've been using for a very long time uh, as Shannon mentioned, I'm a recovering academic. I use this in the very first classes that I taught. And we're going to use something from Christopher Alexander. If you're not familiar with Alexander, um, this comes from a book he wrote in 1964, went into paperback around 1976. And I picked up my first copy of this in 1978. And I know that because I still have that copy. I've had uh, dozens since then. Uh, picked it up at the Harvard Coop in Boston or in Cambridge. And Alexander, in Notes on the Synthesis of Form, 
wrote about the process of designing as an architecture professor, uh, known better in um, computer science circles for work he did on patterns, patterns for architecture that uh, form the basis for a lot of what we do when we're writing software patterns, but this predates that by about a decade. And Alexander talks about the idea of building um, our things, physical things, because uh, he's really looking at uh, buildings and uh, communities. And the form is the part of the world over which you have control. It's what you're building. It's what you can shape while you leave the outside world, everything around it. I'm going to turn this into a Venn diagram as it is. So we're building what's inside that circle. But it has to fit in the context of the world around us. You can't change the context. You have to be aware of it, right? So the goal is to put the context and the form into what he calls an effortless uh, or frictionless coexistence. And when we think about building things, sometimes we forget that uh, whatever we build has to fit in the outside world. And I'm going to use this uh, concept of form and context to think about how we create products, and this is going to be important for manufacturers, how we put products into our lives, and this goes into retail. But basically, what we want to do is look at that bright red line or pink line around the form and think of that as the fit. The best thing that we can do is not what's inside our form, it's to make the interface such that uh, we make life easier for the people that are using it, those that are in the context. And this gets into customer experience, uh, the whole area of customer journeys that's so popular right now. And when we look at um, manufacturing, every manufacturing process represents a form. It's something inside, and that has to fit with the larger uh, context around the world. So that's part one. The next thing I want to do is just two quick slides on machine learning. Uh, if you've been with, the, with us on uh, some of the other webinars, we go into a lot of detail about machine learning. Today, I just want to have enough context about machine learning to make sense of the comments I'm going to make about uh, manufacturing and retail. Because every example that we're going to use today uh, is going to have some reference to machine learning. We don't need to go into a lot of detail, but the core concepts, two things here. When we're dealing with a system, machine learning overall refers to a system that can improve its performance over time by having experience with data rather than explicitly reprogramming. So that's the, the basic for um, machine learning. And that definition goes back to the 1950s with uh, the early checkers playing programs. But the two major areas for uh, machine learning are supervised and unsupervised. The difference there is that supervised, um, when you're building the system, you have to know a lot about the types of data that you're going to be dealing with. And you have to provide some examples, actually, uh, depending on the, the application, quite possibly a lot of examples uh, of the data, and train it to perform. So we have training data sets, and then we have to evaluate it. Versus unsupervised, where basically you're asking the system to identify things uh, that are novel. And I generally like to think of the distinction between those two as when you're dealing with children and you're trying to um, educate them, the supervised approach is you tell them what you want them to learn. You tell them about things. So you say, um, here's a picture. It's a dog. And you know it's a dog because it has these properties. Versus, I'm going to give you some uh, latitude here. Go out in the yard and see what you find. And you find a dog, and then you come back and, and tell me about it. So it's telling them what they're going to look for versus telling them to look for something and tell you about it. In the middle, I have uh, reinforcement learning. The idea of reinforcement learning, very much uh, if you've ever taken a, a psych course, 
in the lab where you're dealing with um, rats as the simplest form of <laughs> animal that you're going to deal with in the lab, you reinforce or reward behavior that you want more of, and you have negative reinforcement or withhold that reinforcement for things that you don't want. Reinforcement learning and machine learning, um, I tend to put it towards the supervised side because you're giving the system that feedback uh, as you're training it. The other two dimensions, general versus deep, the any one of those, supervised, unsupervised, or reinforced, Reinforcement can be done with techniques uh, that are sort of one step, or deep learning, which is the biologically inspired approach that looks like this. And here, uh, the idea of a, uh, a deep learning system is that we've got multiple level, levels or layers which represent the depth of the model, and we start out with something that's very concrete and we try to successively refine our understanding until we get to something that's sufficiently abstract. And the example here is, uh, let's say you have a picture, it's a JPEG file, and so inside that JPEG file, I mean, if you just click on a JPEG file on your computer, you're gonna see a picture, but inside that file is the digital representation of the image at a pixel level. So every pixel has a brightness, it has a hue, has all that good stuff. And if you're looking at it at that level, you don't see a picture, you see digital um, representation. And so the idea is that in a, um, a deep learning system, we can go from that really concrete pixel by pixel to trying to figure out what's in the picture and more abstract representation, the first step in um, sort of video uh, analytics using deep learning is generally to find edges so that we can find shapes. And you find edges by looking for uh, distinctive properties. So if you have an edge in a picture, in general, the color changes along a path and you can start to identify that. And once you found the edges, you can go through it again and find shapes. Maybe you go from uh, just the pixels into um, identifying using the rules of geometry and say, oh, that's pretty close to a right angle. Maybe I've got a, a rectangle or a um, square. You start to pull it all together until finally you figure out what the object is. And the reason this is important is because as we start to look at different ways of um, uh, changing businesses, and we'll start with manufacturing, there are applications where we're going to want to hand this off to a machine learning system to give us information based on successive refinement going from concrete to abstract. Or there are going to be applications uh, in, or uh, along with that, there are going to be applications where we have a lot of training data and we want the machine to take over and start performing these tasks running them uh, more accurately, of course, and more faster than we could. But we just need to understand the idea that this is something that with data and with, um, with the appropriate algorithms, we can get there. And that's as much detail as we need for the rest of the session today. So now we're gonna go into manufacturing. There we go. So, um, and we've done this in the past uh, in the webinar series with a couple of other industries. What I want to do is look at some of the major um, processes that are common across uh, manufacturing enterprises, and then look at the way some companies are solving them. And my, my examples today will be from uh, mostly very large manufacturing uh, operations because I think it'll be easier to, to see. So if you're gonna manufacture something, and we're talking physical objects here, there's a fair amount of planning that goes into it. We need to do uh, product design, we need to figure out what the product is going to be that we're gonna build. Uh, just because we built widgets last year doesn't mean we're gonna build widgets this year. We need to do some research. But once we know what it is we're going to build, let's say it's a car, it's a refrigerator, whichever, um, we have to design it, produce it, ship it out to the rest of the world, and while it's in operation, we have to be able to maintain those. 
We also have to do inventory management, not only of the products, but of all the parts that we need to build the products. So there's a lot of steps that go into it. And what we're gonna look at today is uh, some of the options that AI enables, in particular, the idea of digital twins, automation, disintermediation, uh, used to hate that word, but then I got uh, put into the habit of using it because I taught uh, e-commerce and some strategy in business schools. It's a very commonly used word, the idea of getting rid of um, middlemen or uh, improving processes to take these steps out. And then finally, how do we optimize our global supply chain using AI? So, We'll start with General Electric, one of the largest um, companies in the world. It's a diversified manufacturing and engineering company. And this was from a blog by uh, by Bill Su, the chief digital officer at GE, who's also the CEO of GE Digital. And the article was about the idea of a company like GE, which is about 100 years old, makes everything from locomotives to um, jet engines, uh, very large things to turbines, down to consumer appliances. So what if you woke up one day as a software and analytics company? And that was driven from the top. The idea here is, uh, this is from their, uh, their corporate blog, that you can't just connect the machines. There's a big movement, and, and uh, Shannon mentioned the book I'm working on, I'm really focused on the integration of the IoT, the Internet of Things, and um, making systems more intelligent. And it's important to just uh, make sure we have the common definition. When we talk about intelligence, intelligence is, broadly speaking, the ability to acquire knowledge and to apply it. And by apply it, I mean in, uh, in a new context. And I generally say that uh, at the higher levels of intelligence, you can not only acquire and apply it, you can create new knowledge based on uh, inferential reasoning. So what's happening at GE is they've gone from making uh, large industrial machines, we'll focus on those for a minute, even though, as I say, they make uh, home appliances, washing machines, et cetera, to looking at the world as one where all the machines um, should talk to each other. That's the whole idea of the Internet of Things and the Industrial Internet of Things. They should be able to report on what's going on inside them to uh, another machine or to a person who would be able to uh, use that data. But they should also uh, be able to uh, have some level of intelligence, ability to use that data at the machine as the data is coming in. And so this is a, a real big shift. Certainly uh, a company like GE has gone through automation um, continuously uh, since the inception of the, the assembly line. You know, they've, um, they've gone from changing the way processes are laid out to bringing in robots, to building robots to help build machines. But now it's not enough to have the automation. They want to have the intelligence distributed to the tools that are helping them make the, the products, but also distribute them, distribute intelligence within the products so that they can communicate with each other. And so in the, um, the blog here, they talk about, <coughs> excuse me, talk about um, the idea of connecting this. And then you can take the intelligence that you're getting, and now we're talking about intelligence also in the, uh, the military intelligence uh, usage of the word. We're trying to get understanding of what's happening. And that intelligence represents uh, collecting data about systems as they're being built and as they're in operations uh, at enough detail or at enough of a detail level that that data can then be used as input to refine the operation of the system itself, the machine itself, so a system can self-heal when we get to complicated enough systems, but also that we'll start to collect data from um, 
all of the instances, if you will, of what we sent out there, all of the washing machines are going to send data back, and that will improve our process going forward. So we can start to identify trends, um, can do predictive maintenance, uh, something that is, I was going to say, as important on a washing machine as it is on a jet engine. I guess there's uh, there's different levels of um, importance there, but. It, certainly for any machine that has moving parts, there is a maintenance cycle, which in the past was typically done by um, time. If you uh, think about how your, your car, a modern car, indicates to you that it's time for an oil change, it used to be uh, a simple uh, calculation. It was either X months or X miles, whichever came first, it was time to change the oil. Now we have usage based feedback and usage based uh, maintenance. And that's the type of thing that's going into manufacturing at GE and certainly at other places. But that was the point here, that everything that you build needs to create data that um, can be used in the aggregate to improve the process going forward. It can also be used for uh, predicting the failure but at some point, we would like to be able to share the data among the machines. So if a washing machine in one place uh, discovers that uh, certain load um, configurations uh, cause it problems, right now, it'll communicate back to the manufacturer and say, this is what's happening. And maybe the actual analysis is done remotely, it's done in the cloud. But at some point when the system gets complicated enough, like a jet engine or a locomotive that's uh, you know in, the, in their product line, you want the system itself at the instance level, at the locomotive level, to be able to do some self-healing, but also to communicate that either through a hub at the manufacturer say this is what's happening and then the manufacturer will send out the update to all the other locomotives or what we're starting to see is that sometimes depending on the, the machine machine can talk to another similar machine directly and usually right now that, that's only happening in the actual manufacturing process but the way that happens is if you have robots that are assembling components uh, that end up in a um, complex system. Manufacturing robots today are, uh, in, in many cases, and certainly there are, are simple robots that have single function, but there are robots that can be uh, reconfigured to do different tasks. There are robots that uh, can, actually we'll, we'll see an example in a minute um, when I talk about automobile manufacturing, but robots can be set up to bid on tasks as if they were humans uh, going for eBay, for example. So if a, um, if a line manager, either human or a bot, knows what uh, is needed, I need uh, six Model X locomotives coming up, and we know what that requires in terms of production, <laughs> the robots that are capable of doing those tasks can actually bid on it. You can think about that as being like um, Uber. So I get to the airport and I need a ride home. Right now, the way Uber's configured is I send out my request, Uber tells me how much it's going to be, and then different drivers um, chime in and one of them gets the job. We can combine with machine learning, uh, something like this where I don't have to take the Uber price, I can put out the price that I want to pay, and they, others can bid on it. It's the same today with the most advanced robots that are building these systems. And so a company that you think of as a manufacturing company is in essence now an analytics company. That's what's driving it. With that, uh, continuing with GE for a minute, the idea of digital twins is one that's uh, taking on widespread uh, popularity. Uh, I first started looking at it with uh, SAP, building digital twins. <laughs> but here is um, 
TE, talking about the idea of building digital twins, where it's a software model, it's a logical model that uses data that we have about the physical asset. So we have a, a real wind turbine, a real uh, engine, whatever it is, a complex system, and now we have a logical simulation model of it that's built using data about the real thing. And we can build the, the digital twin actually before we build the real model. If you look at it just as that part, as something that's done before the, uh, the physical model is made, that's pretty comparable to simulations that have been done in manufacturing for decades. You know, wind tunnels, for example, it's a, an aerodynamic simulation. But the idea of a digital twin is that you build a twin, uh, do the simulation, and then build the actual physical asset. But once you deploy the asset, again, it can be something, um, a wind turbine in a remote area where you're not going to want to go maintain that, um, go actually see it uh, any more than you have to have the physical asset fully instrumented with sensors that are connected to the IoT. Those send data to the, um, the digital twin, and the digital twin can then run simulations based on the current real data and do what-if scenarios, um, analysis of uh, various um, operating conditions. And then if you're getting information from all the digital twins, now we can, uh, again, take a look at this and say, all right, what's, what's the pattern? What are we seeing? And that gets into the idea of uh, supervised versus unsupervised uh, machine learning. We may train the system by training the digital twin to, to see how it uh, learns on this training data. But we may also have unsupervised learning where in the real world these um, deployed physical assets are getting information or per, sorry, producing information that's going out in sensors and saying this is what we're really seeing. And it goes back to something that Gauss and Weinberg wrote in a book about requirements where the map disagrees with the terrain, believe the terrain. Well, your digital twin can be really good, but it's the sensors that are providing information off the physical asset if that doesn't agree with what you've modeled, then you need to change the model, you need to change the twin, and that's why these things need to aggregate that data. But it all comes down to having uh, the ability to do machine learning once you're generating and, uh, and gathering all this data. So, take a look at another company, and there's a, a cheat in here that I will acknowledge in a second. So Boeing, one of the world's largest uh, manufacturing companies with operations around the world, headquartered in Seattle, but uh, pieces for um, aircraft are made in a lot of different places. A typical jet engine today has uh, about 5,000 sensors on it, and each of those sensors is reporting on a uh, continuous stream. Some of that data is held on board until the, uh, the flight, the mission is uh, completed, and then it's downloaded in batch. Some of it is reporting information directly into the cockpit. There are things that um, a pilot would want to know about right away. And it's up to um, the, the manufacturer, again, the, you know, this, we're talking the manufacturing industry here, to determine how we want to uh, first of all, which data we're going to, to get and how it's being reported. So some will be streamed, some will be batched, but the area that I think is interesting is that once we have this data, what do we do with it? Sure, you can use it for predictive maintenance, you can use it for um, uh, rebalancing your supply chain if you start to see patterns in the data across planes and we can again use machine learning to see what were the conditions under which that engine was operating and start to uh, allocate uh, replacement parts and, and put them in places where uh, you're expecting the failures or you're expecting uh, you expect to uh, have a need to replace parts 
I was once uh, on a, a jet that had to shut down because the person walked out in front of it. And then the next thing you know, the plane wouldn't start up. We had to wait for parts to be shipped in. Fortunately, it was only a few hundred miles. But uh, the parts that are replaced less frequently, they don't have as many of those. And so if something goes out, it takes a long time. Time is money. The the asset, the asset that the engine is attached to is out of service. So by using machine learning about that data, that's during the operational phase. It's also being used, uh, machine learning uh, at Boeing, for product design now and maintenance. And this has been uh, made public recently. It was some of this was uh, NDA for a while, but Boeing is working with Microsoft and they use uh, a mixed reality platform uh, with a hollow lens to allow engineers to walk through a virtual model of um, aircraft and parts before they're manufactured. It's used to uh, do some predictions. It's used to change designs, again, uh, before these things go on the line. And then the same type of model is used for training people to repair. So you can actually uh, wear the glasses and see what's inside a more complex component before you start to disassemble it. Uh, in addition, at Boeing, they're using uh, cognitive and IoT services from Microsoft Azure to do predictive maintenance and fuel optimization. So by looking at um, the data that's coming in from the planes, you can start to look at it and say, okay, what are the conditions that we're aware of that made um, this engine use more fuel on this route than another one? Is it weather? Is it uh, time that it was used? Is it temperature, uh, altitude? Put all of that in, and that's where the combination of the stuff that you know goes in with um, supervised learning, the stuff that you don't goes in with them. Um, comes out with unsupervised learning where you're finding these patterns, and it all works together. So that's how Boeing is handling it. One more uh, manufacturing example, General Motors, and this is my, they don't build them like they used to slide. Anybody who's sort of followed um, what's going on with, with the automobile industry knows that it's in a massive upheaval right now. Ford announced that they're going to stop making uh, a lot of models of cars for, um, for sale in the U.S. GM has gone through some changes. They're all dealing with the types of uh, manufacturing robots that I just mentioned um, that, that improve the operational performance, the, the um, actual construction performance, if you will. That's been going on for years. What's new is but now, as we move towards um, autonomous vehicles, the machine learning skills and autonomous vehicles are all, um, all use um, machine learning, in particular reinforcement learning for a lot of tasks. <laughs> now, uh, just for fun, I pulled out some uh, employment ads this week. If you see the type of engineers that are being recruited at General Motors, the big push is on people who know analytics, applied statistics, and AI. AI, AI, AI. It's, it's all about um, preparing to, I don't want to say take the intelligence from the driver and put it in the car. It's to change that dynamic and it's to have the car able to not only make decisions, but to communicate those decisions and to be able to communicate with other systems. And uh, those systems can include cars, they can include uh, smart street signs, things like that. But all of that requires an understanding of uh, machine learning. And this is why it's already been used in production. Now it's being used uh, gearing up for, pardon the pun, the whole idea of autonomous vehicles. And so my, my thought on this, and this is uh, the hierarchy of uh, autonomous vehicles uh, from the Society of Automotive Engineers. Everybody's moving from no automation, the 57 Chevy in the background, to uh, automated systems that'll get us to full automation. So 
say first the robots started making our cars and then they started talking among themselves to get smarter. That's where manufacturing robots can, based on the experience they have in assembling uh, pieces, take that knowledge if something goes um, in a way that it wasn't, that it hadn't in the past, there's a new pattern to look at, they can share that knowledge either at the end of the shift or it can be, um, in some cases, if it's something that's critical, um, a failure or an anomaly in one robot might be communicated and shut down the whole line. So that's where they go. And now they'll hopefully learn to drive them. So <clears throat> I just thought it was interesting that uh, today in, uh, or this week I looked on Indeed, they have six pages of job listings for machine learning engineers in autonomous vehicles. Let's move on to retail. So to search, uh, I'm looking for some pictures to go along with the, I think, with the webinar today. I did a search on shopping on one of the photo sites. What I thought was interesting is uh, there are no men. Every picture is of a woman shopping. Talk about stereotypes. Um, we want to look at the whole retail experience, which certainly involves, I would say, every uh, everyone of every age, every gender, every combination um, today acquires some products or services, and that's retail. Well, retail is hard. And here's my uh, my sad example. This is a hardware store in my little town. It's been in business for 27 years, and it's closing at the end of the month. There's a couple of quotes from the owner. It's a family friend. Nuts and bolts don't pay the rent. Amazon has been the big game changer, and everything we sell can be purchased online. So after 27 years, they're going out of business. What can the small guys do? You need to understand what the big guys are doing to get there. So within retail, the basic processes, you've got purchasing, you have to decide what you're going to carry, inventory management once you have it, where the products go in the store, customer service, you got to get people to your store, even if it's a, a virtual store, this for retailing, this works absolutely uh, the same for physical stores and uh, online stores. Go back to John Wanamaker, a well-known um, retailer started out of Philadelphia in two centuries ago, who said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted, the trouble is I don't know which half. And I would say that today, because we have better analytics, um, we're probably still wasting half our money, but we know which half, and so next time we'll change it. So the things that are changing the retail industry include changing consumer habits and expectations. You've got more choices, but most importantly, you have a population that has access to more information. So the reason I asked you to do that mental exercise at the beginning is to think, the difference between buying a car 20 or 30 years ago and today, there's a big difference in the, the cars that are available, the technologies and AI have improved the cars, but the process, you get a lot more information, you spend a lot less time uh, going from place to place, you can comparison shop online, even if you're going to end up buying the car, the, the piano, the washing machine, whatever it is, in a physical store. So question is, how do we reach the people at the right time and how do we make all these decisions? And where does machine learning come in? I'm going to start and have a brief look at Walmart, the uh, largest retailer by volume, by, uh, by revenue. Walmart has long been known as a company that optimized their supply chain. They shared data, they built systems uh, with their suppliers, with their partners. They were able to drive down their costs by sort of reaching into the IT systems of suppliers to uh, help them optimize uh, what was coming into the store, sharing all that information. Uh, back when I was teaching e-commerce, a, a big part of the, the strategy that we had to look at is where else can people get things, what, what options are there, and how do I, I simplify it? They've been doing that for decades at Walmart, and they're very good at it. They've recently, uh, last year, announced a, um, a new venture called Store 8 that is owned by um, 
Walmart. And basically, it's the laboratory that um, they are looking at retailing of the future. They're looking at trends. They've always had that research, but now they're investing in startups that they think can ultimately improve the Walmart experience. So it's, it's uh, primarily done in order to get AI talent and to get people uh, in an entrepreneurial space using machine learning. The reason I say that is if we start to look at what they're doing uh, from a process standpoint, who is Walmart's biggest competitor these days when it you know, wasn't around a couple of decades ago? It's Amazon. We have to look at what they're doing and how that's disrupting Walmart. So Walmart applied for a patent last year on a retail subscription in the Internet of Things environment. Basically, this is a system that will use um, machine learning, it will use some artificial intelligence, and it'll compete with uh, Amazon Dash, it has fewer clicks, and that's always, uh, always the goal. And so it's trying to do automatic replenishment using uh, some predictive modeling, using the data that's generated by tracking things once they leave the store, things that uh, you've purchased. And just as a side note, one of the things um, one of my associates, um, Nicole Speciali, uh, who's done some research on this recently, said that one of the areas that we could start using machine learning and um, video analytics is in the area of loss prevention. And certainly every large store has, uh, has an issue with loss prevention. The idea is that in some places, employees, even if they witness theft, are not allowed to approach the person. You have to have them leave the parking lot and call the police. Well, if you start to have tags at a finer level than the, the big clothing tags on every item, you can track its movement throughout the store just as you track people throughout the store. And then if we add uh, video analytics, we can start to capture information about faces. We can compare those with databases. We can start to automate the, um, the loss prevention. This one is taking it a step further in terms of those tags. Once the item leaves the store, they want to still track it so that they know when something has been used so that you can set up to automatically uh, replenish. Just like with GM, I thought it was interesting to see Walmart. I was like a Walmart is being uh, distributed in terms of um, sending the stuff out to stores, but I never realized how many places they're doing research in these areas. These are all machine learning uh, jobs. A couple of them are duplicates because they're on different platforms, but it's a pretty big push, and clearly Walmart sees that as, as part of the future. Kroger. Kroger has been around for 135 years, biggest uh, global supermarket uh, chain uh, by revenue. This uh, the picture there is uh, from an interview I did with Kroger executives a couple of months ago, and we were talking about their use of analytics and where it's getting into uh, machine learning. They're known for their focus on freshness and customer experience. They do a lot of historical data. Um, capture and they do customized um, coupons like a lot of companies do based on that historical data. But what I thought was really interesting and gives them an opportunity to do some new things, they actually track people's movement throughout a store and their proximity to other people within the store and the way they cluster using heat sensors. And so, for example, if you get uh, four people that are that come in at around the same time and they're all over in the uh, the meat section at the same time, their algorithms are trying to figure out if that represents a family of four or if it's a coincidence that you have four people over there. And the difference is if you have a family of four, that's going to be one checkout. Um, and so versus four, if those people are, are not um, shopping together. And by family, it's a, I mean a, a unit that's traveling together. And they use that now for things like allocating um, people to register. So they don't have to wait until there are 10 people waiting and say, oh, get me another uh, register open. They can say, okay, based on the number of people that we estimate are clustering together, we can move people around and be there when you need it, not in response. So it's, it's predictive. 
you can start to take that with some of the video analytics um, that are out there today. Uh, some interesting companies doing work on everything from emotion detection to um, age, gender, ethnicity detection and start to um, do predictive offers in the store to people based on their behavior and their demographics, even if you don't have personally identifiable information. Um, the North Face, all right, almost almost done with the, uh, the retail examples, but the North Face I had to put in because back in 2013, when IBM first announced the Watson ecosystem, that they were uh, having partners build systems, uh, North Face was one of the first companies that started using Watson and experiments back there. And if you go on the site now, you can use um, the Watson powered app to help you select items. And uh, it'll ask you things like, um, in, in this case, uh, I looked at it for a jacket. What are you gonna use it for? In, in natural language, you can put in, I'm just gonna wear it in the winter in Chicago, or I'm going on a camping trip. Where are you going? How long? What season? And have an interactive dialogue where it narrows the field and gives you a more personalized um, solution. Probably if you've looked at analytics, you've seen that uh, on Friday nights, I guess it is, people who buy beer tend to buy diapers and all jokes aside, there's a lot of um, different uh, scenarios that end up in that same result. But What's interesting to me is the way um, companies like CVS are now aggregating data as, or using the aggregation of data as the basis for uh, corporate mergers and acquisitions in the retail space. So uh, CVS is merging with Aetna to be able to provide more personalization and to do things like combining the data from CVS, they know what um, prescriptions you're taking, so that's, um, that's good data. And Aetna, which has a lot of information on outcomes, and the combination, if you happen to be an Aetna customer and a CVS customer, is that you can, again, get more personalized attention. So all of these have been pretty big organizations. What if you're just a little three and a half billion dollar bomb and pop outfit. I'm going to use Urban Outfitters as an example, or actually Urban, which is the parent that owns Urban Outfitters, Terrain, Anthropology, and a couple of others. They recently hired someone who'd been uh, doing machine learning at Pete Martin to run a machine learning unit at the corporate level looking um, to do logistics optimization, fraud detection, and product recommendations and personalization. And of course, um, recommendation engines are, are things that we've long associated with machine learning. But I did have the opportunity uh, this week to, to talk to the fellow that, that's doing this job. And I said, you know, one of the interesting things is you're looking at this within Urban Outfitters. Um, he gave a, a talk at an event uh, that I attended at, at Google, and they were really focused on things like um, within a line, looking at analytics, uh, just take Urban Outfitters as, as an example. They have very detailed data on different parts of the country, different stores, what type of dress sells based on whether it's a floral print, a solid color, or a stripe and sleeve length. So take those different um, different variables and they can start to predict seasonally what they're going to need and what gets shipped from one store to another when it's, when it's not selling. But they're looking at how to, to take this deeper. And my first thought on this, um, clearly I'm not a shopper because I'm not represented on the page with all the people that are shopping, but I live in a town that has four different uh, stores owned by this uh, parent company, Anthropology, Urban Outfitters, Free People, and another one called Terrain. All of these, and they serve different populations, but I didn't even realize they were all owned by the same 
person, or same uh, entity until this week. And I started talking to um, the fellow about it. Now we can say, okay, you don't have stores all over the country. The fact that you've got four of these stores in one town of 30,000 people tells me that there's a lot in that demographic that you should be able to start doing uh, using machine learning across store, across brand. And right now, uh, we've been advising some clients on using artificial intelligence in the contact center. So you can use information about uh, the person that's calling in and their case and uh, use that to guide which agent is going to help in the contact center. But you can also use that to guide the response that the agent provides. So this whole idea of guided, um, guided agents in a contact center using machine learning is something that, that's just starting to catch on. And it occurred to me looking at this, if you have a family in a town that has multiple stores like this, you can start to collect information and use that to guide them and physically say, you know what, I see what you just bought at one store here. We've got something else at the other store that complements it and complements this member of your family. And all of that is made possible, um, I'm saying here in the third bullet, use artificial intelligence in real life to guide the customers to where they can see what they want to see and where they can get things that are complementary to what they have, what they've just shown the preference for. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to give you the three recommendations and then pull it all together with one thought. So the three things you need to do if you're going to reinvent your business with AI is start with understanding what your enterprise values or where it values natural intelligence. So where do you have people that are key, um, key to the company, not because they do something quickly, but because they add insights, they can take information uh, from a source and uh, synthesize it with other information and apply that knowledge in new circumstances. Is it, if you're a high-end retailer, it may be the, uh, the people in the jewelry department. I'm just making that up, I haven't done the analysis. If you're a manufacturer, it may be people that are, um, that are doing the planning for, um, for maintenance costs. There's generally a small subset of personnel in those roles that adds the most value based on information. The recommendation is to get the data that they have, get more data, use machine learning to augment them, not to replace them, but to make them more effective. So start by figuring out where the natural intelligence comes in augment those roles with machine learning. Where it's, uh, where the company values, where you're rewarding, where you're compensating based on uh, high performance for tasks that are perhaps repetitive or uh, the data doesn't change very much, that's where you want to start to automate. And we don't have time to get into um, whether AI is going to create or, or um, remove jobs, it's going to do both. But th this is the distinction. Where natural intelligence is the priority, augment it. Don't try to replace it. Where uh, repetition, even if it's uh, logical, if it's a call center, there will be um, some aspects of that that can be automated. Just finished writing a paper on, on this whole idea of guided um, support, which would come into play for both manufacturing and retail. You want to be able to handle the mundane things auto, with an automatic response. You want to handle the custom cases with a human response. So that's the first two. And then the third one is look at where you have data and really do an analysis because a lot of data is out there that nobody is touching. Um, I hate the term unstructured data, but the reality is that in many cases there are uh, notes that people keep, there are records that people keep that aren't used for um, decisions in real time or in, in um, customer time, if you will, because it's too hard to use them, use that data. So identify the tasks and then do that partitioning between augmenting and automating, and then identify the data 
and create um, applications using machine learning. It'll depend on what the data is and what you want to do with it, whether you use um, supervised or unsupervised or, uh, or reinforcement learning. But any data that you're collecting, there's probably value to it that's going untapped. And with that, I'm going to close with some thoughts from uh, a session at Google. You may, be, uh, may have heard that Google has uh, or had a big event going on this week called I.O. There are about 7,000 people there. But the day before I.O. started, we had a small briefing uh, going over Google's uh, AI strategy. And before I got there, I didn't know how appropriate it would be uh, to the talk today. But if you look at their vertical industry strategy, they're starting with seven industries, and that includes retail and manufacturing, which is pretty cool since we picked retail and manufacturing for what we were doing on, on today's webinar months and months ago. But here's the thing. Their definition of machine learning as a way of creating problem-solving systems is perfectly aligned with everything that we've been saying here. You can use it. Um, you just need to understand the types of data that are available, the types of tasks that you want to do, and whether you need supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement learning. Google has re, um, rebranded themselves, if you will. It's not actually a, a marketing brand, but saying that they are an AI-driven company. They're an AI company now, and their goal is left to make every company a machine learning company. And I was so happy to see that, that I obviously included as my very last slide here, because that's the point I want to make. If you can do those three things that I just said, identify the stuff where intelligence is valued, identify the stuff where intelligence isn't valued, and then identify new data, you can build a machine learning company or build a company that improves its performance almost immediately using machine learning. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Shannon. Adrian, thank you for another great presentation. I just love it. I don't have any questions coming in, but if you have any questions for Adrian, submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and answer the most commonly asked questions. Uh, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email for this presentation by end of day uh, Monday for this with links to the slides and links to the recording. Um, everyone's quiet today, Adrian. Sorry, I was on mute. I can live with quiet today. <laughs> but seriously, if you have questions, uh, follow up. Oh, like, yeah, follow up. There's, uh, Indeed. And so, <laughs> oh, and I love that topic for next month, natural language processing, always a hot one. Yeah. All right, well, I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for attending today. Adrian, thank you again for another great presentation, and I hope we'll see you all next month. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Bye.